and we'll take about a half an hour for this and then just uh, uh, visit after that. Why don't we uh, start with a question that kind of uh, continues from uh, where you left off. Uh, what is a Muslim's vision of the future of their own religion as opposed to others? What will Islam become? What will become of non-Muslims in both the near future and the end times? Sure. Okay. 25 words or less. Yeah. <laughs> you need to be a, a prophet to answer that one. The whole, part of the miracle of world religions is that they're so resilient and unpredictable. The emergence of none of them could have been foreseen. The current religious situation of the world would be, I'm guessing, all 15, maybe even 10 years ago. Who knows? Uh, generally, in, in Europe and in Britain, we're pretty upbeat, uh, I suppose. Our mosques are overflowing at the time when the churches, for various reasons, are emptying. Uh, the Muslim population of my country grew by 60% just in the last 10 years. We're getting a lot of uh, conversions. I see this in my uh, university community. We're getting a lot of people, young people, coming back to the religion. I'm not quite sure what's driving it. It's certainly not, um, it's not good preaching, I'm afraid. It just happens by spontaneous combustion. So generally, the mood amongst Muslims is quite ebullient and even triumphalistic. But there are so many structural problems in the Islamic world itself that it's quite possible that this move will not last. Uh, country after country is experiencing uh, the, its, its own nemesis as the forces of modernity collide with the forces of Muslim conservatism. And we've seen the catastrophes in Syria, in Egypt and elsewhere. That doesn't bode well. It's, I think ultimately the battles that are being fought out in the Islamic world will determine uh, the longer term trajectory of the religion. Do we have, do we have a speak closer to the microphone? Yeah. Well, uh, I think continuing off. Much of the violence happening today in Muslim areas pits Muslim against Muslim. Do you see this as something that has to run its course? And if so, what should be the non-Muslim reaction? Well, it's the topic of the day, isn't it? Uh, should there be Western intervention in Syria, even though it's a civil strife that doesn't threaten us particularly? Um, the current ructions it's reassuring to remember our recent. Uh, even five years ago, sectarian relations in places like Syria were extremely peaceful in Iraq before the 2003 invasion. There was a lot of intermarriage, a lot of conviviality, cooperation. That was generally the case in the Muslim world until very recent memory, and is still the case in many places today. Um, the current problems are caused to some extent by external interference. Sometimes regimes, in order to justify themselves, uh, adopt a divide and rule policy by inflaming sects, denominations, tribes, regions against uh, each other. Um, generally, the sectarian differences between Muslims are relatively slight. It takes a practice eye to know the difference between a Sunni and a Shi'i when they pray, for instance. It's not like walking into, say, liberal and uh, then an orthodox synagogue where the form of worship is really noticeably different. The things that divide us Muslims for the most part are relatively slight. Uh, and unfortunately, political manipulations and sort of communities feeling that they're losing ground and are uh, threatened sometimes will incline believers to inflate those sectarian differences beyond their natural proportions. What non-Muslims can do about it, I suspect, in most cases, is just to steer clear of it. In England, well, in Britain, we've had our sectarian problems in Northern Ireland, which is still, still smouldering. It's not immediately clear to me what the Muslim world could have done to intervene to sort that one out. It's an internal Christian and um, United Kingdom debate. Are you encouraged by the recent statement by Pope Francis regarding encouraging young people to show respect for others? and to treat them with dignity. And I suppose in answering that, you might talk about the um, official relations between the different uh, traditions. 
Yeah, John Paul II was extraordinarily popular in the Muslim world. Um, the, uh, his successor was more of a European academic with less experience of engaging with other religions, and he uh, unwittingly antagonized many of the Jewish communities as well as many of the Muslim communities as a result of certain perhaps uh, improperly vetted comments that, that, that he let slip. Uh, the mood music now coming from the Vatican seems to be uh, a lot more canny. Uh, Francis spent some time in Buenos Aires in close engagement with uh, Muslim communities there and local Spanish-speaking Muslim leaders uh, and perhaps coming from, as it were, a, a non-central part, geographically speaking, of Western civilization gives them a great empathy for what it is to be uh, marginalized, what it is to be different. Uh, so generally, the Muslim reaction to Pope Francis has been positive, although as yet he's not made a a substantial statement on uh, non-Christian religions, which isn't really his theological forte. He's more pastoral, he's more church unity, he's more uh, reconciliation, he's more engaging, I think, with modernity than other religions. But so far, the message has been positive. Is the protection of the other extended to religious minorities alone are there others beyond the pale, specifically wondering about equal marriage rights laws, same-sex couples? Well, the, one of the things I should have mentioned was that uh, the DIMMA protection laws uh, generally uh, applied in their full form only to Christians and Jews, and it was a puzzle for Muslim jurists to know what exactly to make of Buddhists, Hindus, and others who simply didn't seem to be mentioned in the Muslim scriptures. Uh, generally, what the jurists did <coughs> was to assimilate those communities to uh, the category of protected communities, but they were not regarded as Ahlul Kitab, people of a scripture. So the Hindus in India, although subject to a range of legal disabilities, depending on the, the, the ruler, uh, were allowed to continue uh, to exist, and Buddhism as well. Um, regarding the specific uh, sort of second part of this question, I think probably if we were to do justice to the question of same-sex relationships and minorities in that sense, um, that would take us too far afield. I've already approached a wide range of topics and, and I think we're probably best to stay within that bandwidth this evening. Is there a modern example of the concept of Islamic protection of minorities? In other words, a particular example that has a modern context within the last century. Yeah, this, this is interesting. Uh, if you look at two significant experiments, uh, the replacement of former military secular autocracies with religiously driven democratic political movements in the Islamic world, two very important countries, Indonesia and Turkey, uh, the policies have been quite different. In Indonesia, Abdurrahman Wahid said, the chronic way of dealing with minorities is to give them full legal equality, although we do nonetheless recognize them as bodies within society. It's not the French model of just dealing with citizens. The state deals with um, them as corporate religious bodies, as well as, as citizens with full equality and freedom of religion, which is, um, in any case, the deep. Uh, instinct of most Indonesian Muslims anyway. It's a very multicultural, hybridized kind of place. I think it's the only country I've been to where a worship space was shared, and has been shared for hundreds of years, between Taoists, Muslims, and Catholic Christians. I've not seen that anywhere else. Um, regarding Turkey, uh, the sort of Islamism light of Erdogan and his government has manifested itself as complicated and interesting uh, religious minority politics. Of course, Muslims are 99% of the population of Republic of Turkey anyway. But still, uh, unlike his secular predecessors, he has taken significant steps to um, reopen some Christian places of worship. So the Turkish government recently uh, paid for the renovation and the reopening of the Bulgarian Orthodox Cathedral in the Fenway district of, of Istanbul. Uh, just last year, they passed a the, the secular is quite an um, inflammatory law allowing um, church monastic properties in central Turkey to be reclaimed uh, and re-consecrated 
by uh, Orthodox Christian communities, and he's, he's, he's done quite a lot along, along those lines. Um, whether he will be able to reopen the Orthodox seminary, uh, which is uh, in Istanbul, is a critically important question, because Orthodoxy recognizes the ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople as its, or well, the nearest thing they have to a pope. And according to the church laws, he has to be drawn from the clergy of Constantinople. And there are not that many left. And they have to be trained in Constantinople, which means that they have to be trained at that seminary, which is on an island called Hebeliada, which has been closed for 40 years. So they have to move quickly to reopen that and to allow um, the young, mostly Greek, uh, speaking Turks of Istanbul to, to train once again as, as seminarians. And I think probably he will do that. Um, I met him actually last, last month. He is genuinely open to religion as a wider phenomenon, just a Muslim religion. But beyond that, of course, there's a question of whether Muslim sites closed by the secularists will be allowed to reopen, which is a much more touchy issue in Turkey. There's 400 semi-derelict Sufi lodges in Istanbul which were closed by Ataturk and which the secularists are determined shall never be uh, reopened again. Some people would look cynically on the Turkish government's policy towards the Christians and say they're only doing this so that they can then go on to provide um, legal equality for Muslims, which we simply will not allow. For instance, last year he allowed female students in Turkish universities to wear the Islamic headscarf, which really infuriated a lot of people who are now protesting in Istanbul, the Gezi Square demonstrators, partly motivated by the desire to bring back uh, the prohibition on uh, the headscarf spaces in Turkey. So some of it's theology, some of it's religion, some of it's sincere, some of it's politics. Um, but generally, I would say, Turkey has moved forward in the last uh, 10 or 15 years, rather than backwards. Would you tell us a bit about the uh, Cambridge Muslim College where you Yeah, it, it, it sounds grandiose, uh, but it's actually a very small institution. 18 students at the moment. Uh, essentially what we do is, independently of the university, we're a freestanding uh, religious trust, is that we take the graduates of the existing Islamic seminaries in England, of which there are about 25, these are trained imams, and we give them one year of intensive recalibration so that they can be more appropriate as faith leaders in the context of modern British society. So. They know nothing about Christianity, so we're bringing Christian theologians and priests to tell them about Christianity. And we take them to the Vatican, they stay in a monastery. Actually, they met Pope Francis on the last visit, and there's even a YouTube clip which you can find, which is blessing the dedication from the Cambridge Muslim College. Um, and uh, similarly with Jews, most of our training imams have never met a Jew in their lives, so we bring in rabbis, like conservative Orthodox rabbis, to explain what Judaism is. They do a lot of pastoral training, how to deal with addiction, how to give a good sermon, how to deal with the young, uh, and also science and religion issues, which um, uh, are big in England at the moment. The new atheism is, is, is gaining ground. So to give them a sense of what Muslim theology says about the Big Bang, evolution, and those uh, tricky questions for, for theists. So it's kind of a, a grab at all kinds of different different subjects, but the intention is just to make them more relevant, more open as bridge builders rather than as gatekeepers for, for the Muslim community. And I think generally the experiment has been positive. We have female as well as male students with a good relationship with all of the seminaries. Sometimes we wish there weren't so many of them, uh, but Britain is graduating 800 imams every year now, which is more than priests are training in the Church of England, for instance, which is a ridiculous overproduction. But we take the best ones, and sometimes once they've done our little one-year diploma course, they then go out to other countries um, in order to spread what we hope is a message of better understanding and more relevant faith leadership um, in those places. So here's a, an academic question. Uh, Kierkegaard struggles with the story of Abraham. For Islam, is this a case of the moral being subverted to the divine universal? It's a, it, a good question. It doesn't have an answer. Uh, what I was referring to in my talk was not Abraham's sacrifice, but Ishmael specifically and the significance of, of Ishmael, which is important. 
for how Muslims imagine um, God's purposes in bringing their religion about. Uh, the story of the binding of Abraham's son is told somewhat differently in the Quran than it is in the book of Genesis. I think probably we don't have time now to go into the nuances of the difference, uh, but simply uh, if I just comment briefly to say that the majority school of Sunni Islamic theology uh, does adopt what some Calvinists would recognize, for instance, as a command ethic that uh, good and evil are determined finally by divine decree, but not something that can be rationally worked out by observing the stuff of the world. And that the point about uh, God's commandment to Abraham was to indicate that he is the ultimate source of value. And even if we think it's outrageous, God is um, the superior source of, of, of virtue. Um, but that's a crude oversimplification of both our theology and of the difference between the Genesis and the Quranic narrative. Could you comment on the uh churches that were burned in Egypt and whether they will be rebuilt? Churches in Egypt are a bone of contention because there are some very chauvinistic elements in the Coptic church that have been constructing excessively gigantic and provocative churches, and I've seen them myself, the new cathedral in Aswan, where there's only a very small Coptic community, completely dominates the skyline for miles around. It's a huge concrete barn. And they do that really just to, to um, antagonize, I believe that's, that is the case. Uh, and the fact that the British in Egypt, like uh, colonial rulers elsewhere, systematically favored Christian minorities has left a sense that these are fifth colonists, that they're actually not sympathetic to local issues, and that as Christians their loyalty is the life to be with the West. So I know that there's an issue between those countries and the West, the Christians are often left quite vulnerable as symbols, look like vulnerable symbols of, of, of the West. It's not actually the case because some of the founders of Arab independence and Arab nationalism were actually Christians themselves. And the Christian churches in Egypt tend to be more anti-Israel than many of the Muslim leaders. So the Pope, uh, the Coptic Pope, still insists that any Copt who goes to Jerusalem, for instance, even if it's just to pray, is automatically excommunicated because the Copts do not recognize the legitimacy of the, the states of, of Israel. So the popular Muslim sense that these people are fifth colonists of the West uh, is misplaced, sadly misplaced, but still they're vulnerable, just as whenever there's something unpalatable happening in the Muslim world, mosques in England get attacked. Um, we've had a number of attacks recently in Cambridge just three weeks ago. Somebody was uh, arrested for trying to attack our, our little mosque. Um, more than half of the mosques in Britain have been attacked in the last 10 years. I was in Sweden where the mosque in Malmö has logged 250 attacks since it was built in the late 80s. So it's the same thing. Local people who don't know much about religion see the local presence of the detested other community as being the target that they have to go for. Um, but theology has nothing to do with it. But if you look around, you'll see some very beautiful images of devout Muslims forming human chains around the churches in Egypt in order to protect them from some of these people who may conceivably, and it's not a cons conspiracy theory, be uh, agent provocateur by the uh, military elite in Egypt staging attacks on these churches in order to get the West to sympathize with the military coup against the Islamists. But there's certainly some demonstrable cases where the Muslim Brotherhood has actually physically protected um, the churches from more radical attacks. Can you discuss the concept of justice from an Islamic perspective? Uh, justice was, the divine justice was, as in other theologies, a bone of contention for medieval Muslims, partly as a result of the, the debate that I broached with reference to the story of Abraham. Is justice simply what God determines to be right? Or is justice something that is intrinsic in the nature of the universe and which God will always act in conformity with? And this goes back to uh, dilemmas that are cited in Plato, if not before. Is there something intrinsic about justice? 
And on the face here, many of us would say, yeah, it's instinctual, it's, it's part of being alive. Even little kids are very concerned that justice should be done. Or is it not part of the material world at all? It can only really be known if you have uh, the benefit of, of recourse to revelation. In that Islam, a movement called the Moctezumite said, just as it is intrinsic, God must always act in a way that rationally can be demonstrated to be just. But the majority school, the Sunni school, took the view that there is nothing in reason that can reliably and definitively determine what justice is or where it, um, where it, where it, where it is present. And therefore, uh, good and evil and laws are only really binding upon us as accountable human beings if we have solid information about God, what actually wants in Revelation. You can intuit good and evil as a kind of informed, conscientious observer of creation, but it only really becomes definite knowledge if you have something like the Ten Commandments. Would you explain the um, basic differences between Sunni and Shia? It's complex because there are sort of atmospheric or meta metabolic differences between the two that are quite significant, and formal differences which really are quite slight in most cases. Uh, the difference emerged as a result of a political or a theological argument over who should be a successor to the Prophet's temporal authority after his death, and those who came to identify themselves as Sunnis said it should be uh, Abu Bakr, and those who uh, self-identified as Shia said no, it should be Prophet's cousin, son-in-law Ali. And for a long time, it was simply a matter of uh, contesting claims to political legitimacy. As the centuries rolled on, the Shia in particular developed ambitious ideas of the Imam, the descendant of Ali, having charismatic and miraculous powers and enjoying infallibility and also full knowledge of the future. And therefore, uh, a saying of one of their imams enjoys effectively the status of revelation. Whereas the Sunnis say, you know, revelation ends with the Quran, with the death of the Prophet. Subsequently, there's only a, discu there's only a discussion amongst uh, jurists and legists. In practice, although that sounds like a big difference, um, they all pray five times a day in the fast of Ramadan, the Hajj to Mecca. Basic theology is, is still the same. The copy of the Quran is identical in, in, in both cases. Uh, but because of certain early memories, a sense of grievance, martyrdom, expropriation that has coloured the Shi'i sense of uh, religious history, the atmospherics have often led to a certain uh, deep rift between the Sunni and the Shi'i soul. Although, as I mentioned earlier, until very, very recently, people didn't worry too much, we didn't care too much. In a country like Pakistan, 20 years ago, there might not have been much intermarriage. But there was mutual respect, and the rituals of each side were allowed to happen unmolested. It's only very recently, with the advent of uh, Islamist and intransigent forms of religious literalism, that these uh, implicit differences have crystallized out into major sectarian and, and political rifts. And, it, an issue or a question for all um, of the traditions, the um, extraction of particular scripture um, and uh, is there something about the Quran that's particularly susceptible to this or is it the same the same issue uh, for all scripture of extracting for particular purposes rather than looking at the whole um, perhaps this is even more of an issue for Muslims than it is for many Christians because in Christianity really the revelation as I understand it is in Christ himself, the word made flesh amongst us, and the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit and scripture, even the gospels are a kind of witness to what is the real revelation. In the Islamic context, I suppose as in the Jewish context, the revelation is the book. And therefore, who gets to interpret the book and on what basis becomes absolutely critical for the, the shape of the religion. Uh, the Shi'i tradition just mentioned will limit authoritative interpretation of the many complex, difficult, ambiguous passages of the Qur'an to the infallible Imam. The Sunni tradition will limit it to the consensus of scholars. If all of the Sunni scholars agree with a particular verse or hadith, 
means a particular thing that becomes definitive, decisive religious teaching. But of course, more often than not, they don't agree, which is why Sunni theology, but particularly Sunni law, is an extremely diverse and pluriform tradition with four quite different traditions of, of Sharia for Sunni Muslims, each reflecting a certain point of view that developed often in regional schools in the first three centuries of Islam as to the correct way in which the Quran and the Hadith should be interpreted. This will be the, the last question, and I want to thank you very much for the time you spent with us this evening and interesting comments. Would you address the diversity of interpretation of Sharia in modern Muslim states? Yeah, but there's a, a great American scholar, Noah Feldman, who's written a book called After Jihad, in which he talks about what he says is actually a very exciting, creative, uh, and innovative period in which a Sharia theory now finds itself. Um, he's generally pretty upbeat, and he's, because he's, he knows Arabic, he did a DPhil in Oxford, he knows beyond the headlines the extraordinary diversity and the creativity of the thousand and one ways in which Muslims are trying to, to grapple with with modernity. The, uh, the underlying problem, however, remains uh, how in the context of modernity one can remain truly authentic as a legitimate heir to a millennial and much-loved uh, tradition in the face of the secularizing, globalizing, uh, anonymizing processes of modernity. The danger is that religion becomes primarily a quest for roots, a quest for identity, rather than primarily a quest for God. And much more than Islamism is in fact identity politics, rather than something that's primarily driven by a, a theological vision. That's one reason often for its intransigence and often its, its ill-tempered uh, approach to, to criticism. I like to see 9-11 as a kind of temper tantrum, really. It had nothing to do with it theology or vision of man, it was just outrage, pride by people who felt that their identity was being confiscated by American military and cultural penetration into their heartlands. So that has nothing to do with real religion. It's more like the tribalism that the Quran came to supplant, but it's still very powerful. So uh, it's a question, I think, that not just Muslims, but everybody who loves his or her religious heritage and relationship with God has to grapple with. It's the modern world in its origins emerged as a reaction against religion at the time of the Enlightenment, or at least against mainstream established monotheism in favor of deism or often quite uh, atheistic perceptions of, of reality. How do we be fully part of that, as I suspect most of us want to be, but still fully part of the tradition which the Enlightenment and its forms which now shape today's world came to replace? And I don't have a, an easy answer to that, except to say that I have met so many creative people who are passionately and evidently authentically part, both of their modern realities in their workplace, in their families, wherever it might be, but also fully participating in the richest vein of their own religious tradition, that I can see that it, it works, that it can work. Often our religious leaders are not the best guides, I'm afraid, to doing that. And it may be that one way in which monotheism morphs over the next century is to move away from hierarchical and leadership directed forms of religion and more towards an individualist type of piety. Uh, there are many drawbacks and dangers to that. Often fundamentalism emerges precisely as a reaction against the perceived irrelevance of established religious leadership. But um, one of the reasons, I think, for the ongoing strength of Islam globally is the sense that one is not linked to a particular hierarchy, but uh, one can, as it were, be freelance. One can find one's own position within a uh, Muslim community, and one can feel at ease both with modernity and the West in a way that is appropriate to one's own capacities and metabolism, rather than accepting some directive from on high, determining that there must be a particular uh, relationship between the two. I don't think that there is one way of squaring the tension between modernity and tradition that works for everybody. I think it's something that individuals and communities, church groups, mosque groups, uh, whatever, have to sort out for themselves.
Thanks. Let's uh, visit and have a good evening. So if I have, if I can have your attention for just some uh, logistics here. Uh, one of the things that uh, our uh, friends always have asked us is, it would be wonderful to have a, a period after a talk such as this to kind of uh, discuss among ourselves and kind of uh, reflect on what we've heard and so on. So this is really the, the part of this uh, event tonight uh, for you to kind of reflect, talk with one another, um, you know, and kind of uh, uh, maybe repeat some of the things you've heard and get clarity from one another and so on. What I would suggest is that if we can, please try to mix up these uh, tables with uh, Jews, Christians, and Muslims if possible. We have not done this formally, but you know, try your best to, to have a diverse uh, uh, you know, group of people on each table. Uh, and also the Sheikh is going to be sitting at the table at the, uh, at the other end of this room. Uh, and uh, at a time, two or three people can go and actually sit down with him, uh, if, if, you, if you wish, uh, ask any specific questions that you may not have asked that you would like to ask, uh, or just to introduce yourself and kind of uh, get to know him a little bit. But please don't spend a lot of time because it's a pretty large group and uh, we want as many people to get a chance. Uh, somebody will be there to kind of uh, facilitate that at the, uh, that table at the very end. All right, thank you all very much. Enjoy the, the conversation. The, the, the session will end at 9 o'clock. At, at 9 o'clock you're free to go. Of course you can go out.